a nefarious nightmare contains themes that may be explicit or triggering for some. Specific warnings and disclaimers will be mentioned in the show notes. A nefarious nightmare assumes all parties that are mentioned in these cases to be innocent unless proven guilty in a court of law. Listener discretion is strongly advised. You can help us grow the show by leaving us a five-star written review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or you can join our Patreon for lighthearted bonus content. With this, welcome to Season 5. You finally realize that your whole childhood, nobody protected you the way they should have. And as a daughter, I can forgive, but as a mother, I never will. And that's from a TikTok video at anyone but Autumn. I won't let pain turn my heart into something ugly. I will show you that surviving can be beautiful. Christy Ann Martin. Today we continue with phase three of this series with Jennifer's story. While Jennifer has always been very kind and always has a beaming smile on her face, deep down she's continuing a journey of self-discovery and seeking peace and justice. She opens up and talks about how she survived being assaulted as a young child by a sibling and his friend, and how to this day she's searching for answers. Answers that some of those closest to her are unfortunately not willing to give her. Now please be advised, anyone who's a victim of a sex crime, no matter what time, age, and even what the extent of it is, has every right to pursue research, gain answers, and take some semblance of power back. Your body, your choice. With that, I'm Courtney Fenner. And I'm Amanda Cronin. And a nefarious nightmare presents Still Minding the Beehive, Surviving Sex Crimes, Part 12. As you all know by now, we dive extensively into sexual assault and statistics, and we discuss various forms of sex crimes. We even search and report on what to look for, how to identify grooming and even psychological impacts, and we also dive deep into certain mental disorders such as sociopathy and narcissism, and we talk about incest. But one question does stand out in our minds, one that is hard to tackle but must not be excluded. What if the perpetrator is another child? The question is a very challenging one to answer, as we have done our own research and have found it to be exactly that, a challenge. But while challenging, it's not impossible to find. We wonder if maybe these reports and statistics are hard to find because since sex crimes is already considered to be somewhat of a taboo subject, it's that much more taboo when it's minor on minor sexual violence. We get it. Nobody wants to think about it. Nobody even wants to imagine the what ifs. What if my child is being abused by their sibling? Or what if my babysitter's 14 year old son is doing inappropriate things to my child? Some might think, well, the parent seems fine. I see no red flags there. They've got it all under control and their kid isn't gonna do anything. It's as though we all want the answers, but at the same time, people might unintentionally avoid talking about it in hopes that they can ignore the problem away. But it is a problem and it can't be ignored. There has got to be a way to see signs of grooming and red flags that someone could perpetrate sexual abuse no matter what the age is. With this, we have to see the statistics, signs of grooming in adults, and try to equate that in the perspective of a minor because just like with adult perpetrators, it can be easy to miss or overlook these signs in children. However, with the proper tools and education, it's not impossible. So we are going to attempt to give you all the red flags to look for, and hopefully we can prevent this from happening in the future. DefendInnocence.org defines the term child-on-child sexual abuse, or COXA, as sexual activity between children that occur without consent, without equality, which is mentally, physically, or in age, 
or as a result of physical or emotional coercion, which will be discussed in a minute. What this means is that a power difference exists between the two children, whether that is in age, size, or ability. The first thing that needs to be understood, and you will hear a lot about this in today's case, is if you are a parent or a caregiver, while you do not want to even think that your child could potentially be a victim of sexual assault by another child, or you don't even want to live in a world where a scenario exists that a child can be in a sex offender, that we do indeed live in a world in which that does exist. And you have to ask some questions though. First off, is your child exhibiting signs of being molested by a trusted caregiver or parent? While we never want to blame someone who has been victimized themselves, there is evidence that supports the fact that offenders often reoffend, and that offenders were often groomed and victimized themselves. As a child, they will often, not always, but often, mimic things that happen to them at home or at school. If you look at the sheer fact that minors are always in an educational setting to begin with, from around 4 to 5 to about 7 to 18, it's because education is crucial for an ever-growing and evolving brain. Brains are literal sponges for information and retaining memory, which is why those ages are ideal for going to school. Unfortunately, when that brain is still developing, it retains bad information and memory as well. One sign to look for in a child is to see how they act out. Are they suddenly having violent outbursts? Are they afraid to be around someone? Now, shyness and anxiety is common in children, but what we mean is, is one child actively avoiding somebody else in a disturbing way, like crying and throwing a huge fit at the mere presence of someone, or acting different and even quietly fearful of one person more so than anyone else? Now, there are physical signs to pay attention to as well. Are you seeing blood stains randomly in places that shouldn't be having blood stains? Are they mimicking inappropriate acts with other people or at play? While these things don't always suggest the worst case scenario, they often do. Finally, is your child telling you straight up that they've been handled inappropriately? Are they telling you that they do not like somebody but can't give you any kind of reason why? Even if you don't want to believe them, you really should. It's better to take an accusation seriously, nip it in the bud even, and find out later that it's untrue, as you can handle the repercussions later, than to ignore it and find out as they grow that what they said was factual, as you cannot change the trajectory as they age. Always believe someone when they say this happened to them. One thing that we want to stress is that when your child comes to talk to you about anything, listen and engage with empathy. Be their biggest support. Love them and advocate for them because children cannot do it on their own. Children rely on their parents to fight for them, for their peace, their protection, and their rights. And this includes actively protecting them from what this shitty world will take from them. The following is an example of what a parent avoiding the truth looks like. Another day, another dollar. Ooh, I better hurry. School is almost out and I need to pick Jason up from kindergarten. <sighs> hey, what's wrong, honey? I, uh, mom, did you know about... About... Honey, I'm so sorry, but can you make this quick? I have to pick up your little brother. Did you know... Honey, spit it out. Did you know what had happened to me? That I was sexually assaulted? <laughs> Honey, we've talked about this. Is it really necessary to rehash this? Mom, yes. We really need to rehash. Young lady, how many times do I have to tell you that they were just kids? You were just a kid. You played with them. They did their time. They were punished and we settled it. What more can you possibly want? Mom, I am not okay and I've tried to tell you but you're refusing to understand. Sometimes I don't think you care about me. How dare you? Do you not understand what this has done to your father and I? What about your baby brother? Do you not care about how this could possibly affect him? 
Shouldn't you be over this by now? Mom, I was six years old. I'm experiencing so much sadness and weirdness. I still don't understand. I need you, Mom. And instead of being here for me, you're more focused on the two monsters that did this this thing to me and I- Monsters? <laughs> oh, good Lord, you're delusional. How many times do I have to say that you were all kids? You all did this. I don't want to hear any more about it. End of discussion. I guess she doesn't care about me. I guess she hates me. I guess I'm a liar to her. I hate that this happened. I don't know what to do. I love her and I believe her, but shouldn't she just be over this by now? <sighs> Honey, cheer up. Smile. You're beautiful with that smile. Don't let people see your secret written all over your face. They'll just take advantage of you. I'm sorry for getting so mad, honey. I love you. Why don't you go for a walk or maybe call your friends? They always make you feel better. Ugh, I have to go. Your little brother is waiting. Guess I'm just going to have to keep smiling and pretend everything is perfect. Okay, mom. Thank you. I love you too. When a child experiences abuse from another child, it can be just as traumatic as if it were done by an adult. Unfortunately, this type of abuse often goes unreported. Sometimes, adults dismiss it as kids being kids, or there may be a fear about what will happen to the children involved if the abuse is known. It's important to understand that both children involved in this situation need help. The child who is being abused deserves the appropriate care to prevent lifelong trauma, which is unfortunately common among survivors of child sexual abuse. They may also experience various symptoms as a result. Additionally, the child who is engaged in harmful sexual behavior, or HSB, also needs assistance. By seeking help from a licensed medical or mental health professional, they can work through these age-inappropriate behaviors and reduce the likelihood of engaging in HSB once again. Remember, as you will hear in Jennifer's recollection of events, providing support and guidance to both children involved is crucial in helping them navigate through this difficult situation. And to the day of writing for this episode, Jennifer is still working to utilize FOIA, which is the Freedom of Information Act, to obtain records and reports on her case. In the meantime, she wanted to speak out and finally tell her story, because as you will hear, she has been silenced so much about this. Let's not silence her anymore. Let's instead listen to what she has to say. My name is Jennifer. I am from Texas. Um, <laughs> uh, I love anything art or artsy. I love to redo and vamp up furniture, and I love to paint and doodle. Um, and just uh, I do it with my children, and I my mother does it with me as well. She did it with her mother. It's a big long run of uh, art artists in the family, I guess. But uh, that's very enjoyable, and I'm obsessed with birds, so I'll make random bird noises. I absolutely love them. Um, things I hate, I try not to hate things, but man, things I hate, I cringe. I don't know why. I can't explain it at Ben Stiller. I can't stand him. I don't, I'm sure he's a nice person. But he makes me cringe so bad. <laughs> that's, um, yeah, that's <laughs> something about it. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry about it. <laughs> My bad, dude. I'm sure you're a really nice person. <laughs> but I was a survivor of a sibling sexual abuse crime with a friend uh, when I was eight. The year that it happened was 2001, and it, it happened in Irving, Texas, and it just happened once uh, over a summer um, at my dad's apartment. Um, prior prior to the abuse, um, Josh and I had a distant sibling relationship. 
uh, didn't have much of one. We were super close, basically brother sister arguments, just never really on the same wavelength or really got along. Um, and Cannon, the second abuser, uh, I didn't. I, I really didn't have much of a relationship with him, honestly, because he was newer to the picture. He was my dad's newer girlfriend's son, so he was really connecting with my brother as they're both boys. He was a little older, so my brother was connecting with him and trying to impress him, it seemed, but I was more passing here and there. I mean, he would, like, be flirty and kind of friendly with me, but we didn't have much of a relationship beforehand. Um, I was eight years old, and my brother was five years older than me. He was 13 or 14, I believe. I believe he was 13, and it's a, and he would uh, turn 14 later on after the summer ended. But um, And then Cannon was 16. I've been angry for a very long time. And I'm working on that, so I'm trying not. To, I'm trying to work on my anger now, because <laughs> it's avoiding and being angry isn't getting me anywhere. <laughs> so when I was younger, I wasn't noticing these flat red flags, um, but thinking back now, I, I constantly see red flags. I during the summer that I can think back on was when Lee, his mother, was around. Uh, Cannon always gave me a lot of attention and would be really flirty with me and just real friendly and I just thought that was really cool because he was older but um, at the time I didn't see it much of as a red flag as I thought it was kind of flattering but I was constantly left alone so I usually like would seek out attention and get there I would enjoy the attention that I would get anyways because I was just constantly left alone so another red flag I'd pick up on is his mom would always like want to take me shopping and she would always just be like if you're good as long as you're good you know we'll go get presents and she'll tell me she'd always tell me how pretty I was and um want to get me a doll and stuff it was weird <laughs> like thinking about it now and how she her tone was with me and like it was just the more I read into it later on down the road, I'm like, oh, okay, she was covering up for him because I find out later down the road she was aware and I was not his first and only victim. I definitely think that she knew what her son was doing or had an idea and and I don't think she knew how to handle it and she he was already in her custody because of that, because of sexual issues already. And um, so, yeah, I think she was just in case either they were going to happen or she knew they were going to happen. I don't know. But it was more of a, hey, as long as you're good and quiet, I'll keep buying you gifts, which it was always so uncomfortable because they were always dolls. And in the end, when everything went down, he ended up like owing money to me. And so my mom, weirdly enough, would get excited and be like, oh, look, we got another check in the mail. Let's go shopping. And we'd always get a doll. <laughs> it was so weird <laughs> how it all ended up lining up together. It ended up getting Bratz dolls. And I had like all the collections, all because um, someone owed me money because I was abused. <laughs> It's so weird. It's so weird. And the, I forget what dolls they're called, but the, my daughter used to have a ton of them. And then they had all the like creepy stripper pantyhose and like secret messaging and stuff. And I was like, oh, I well, oh my gosh, when, you know, Bratz dolls were already borderline. Now we're wearing stripper clothes. <laughs> just, but it's like, you, you know, you go back and forth. You're like, oh, they're just expressing themselves. And you're like, okay, why are they dressing like this as little girls clothes? When I wanted these little girls clothes when I was little. And it's just like so crazy, stuck in a hypocritical, terrible, sexualizing kid moment always. <laughs> The way my brain works, like, I feel like it was a different lifetime. It feels like a different person. Like, yes, it feels like me, but I feel like I'm so dis disassociated from it. And that's what I do in, in times of trauma. And it's hard to, like, it affects me now in my now life because I don't want to disassociate, you know. I want to enjoy my life. And I just you know, disassociate in times and you're just, like, pull back in, pull back in. You know, you don't need to fade out because I remember fading out so often in my childhood. And random things come back to me like oh I don't have to do that anymore <laughs> but um, it just 
it, yeah, it's 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 weird to have these moments of just kind of like a that's so raven like flash of just oh trauma oh that's what happened oh and it's just but it's like a it's like a movie honestly it's like a it's like a flash of a trailer of something you kind of remember but it's like I watched it from the outside I don't know if that was my coping mechanism or not but anytime I have memories or think back of a moment it's literally like a movie a nightmare movie but but I think that's how I I can I can I can disassociate with it like when I'm you know maybe having a good night at drinking or something it may come out and I get a lot more emotional with it but I can usually stay pretty emotionless with it I always think about when I'm walking like I, it doesn't matter how I feel um, you know you got to think about other people too and everybody has a shit day I'm having a shit day but if I can make someone else feel better just because I smiled you know that'll make me feel better too and it'll the smile slowly turns genuine I've had so many people stop me when I'm just zoning out not realizing I'm smiling because I've been taught to smile for so long that you know smile is welcoming I have you you have a glow about you you have an energy about you that's welcoming you need to smile um I was just been taught that forever forever and it got annoying to me that I made it I tried to make it good again because I had so many people stop me like hey you have such a nice smile thank you you know I see you smiling and and I appreciate it I'm like you know what yeah because I was gonna about to start I was just about to start having a resting bitch face all the time because I'm so annoyed with people coming to me and saying and dumping their problems on me and talking to me because I'm so welcoming but that is why I do it because someone saw me and said thank you I just you make my day better because you just smile all the time and you're just always smiling something's positive I'm like I can keep being positive I'm like that's why I smile you know it ends up being genuine at the end of the day because fake it till you make it it sounds dumb but it it does come through Um, and so I just yeah I just try and put it on as much as I can because even because people do catch me when I'm not smiling they're like hey what's the matter so it's like oh even if I have our steam bitch face they're still gonna ask me problem they're gonna still talk to me so (laughs) might as well be smiling (laughs) so and I've gotten better at being able to be vocal about what I want to be able to be approached and I'm not (laughs) I definitely feel like it's it's a coping mechanism. I feel like two different people at times. I feel ice cold and then I feel so emotion, emotional all the time. I feel everyone's feelings. Um, it's like a, a switch and I, I know when I need to put that switch on and I know when I do it just almost in an evil way, feeling like, oh, I know I don't need, I don't want to feel this way. So I'm going to put turn on the petty switch you know it's it's it does feel like a 100 percent a coping mechanism because i know i can be too nice but i don't know how to balance it out too much so i just turn into a bitch <laughs> i can either be way way too kind or way way too bitchy there, it's almost like there's no middle it's so weird i i am the most empathetic person yet i can be the most cold and ruthless bitch you know it throws my husband off it's like you are one ruthless petty bitch but you're not at all like i don't get it that's not you but it is (laughs) oh it is (laughs) i'm like yeah don't fuck with me (laughs) but but i I just never want to hurt anybody so i'm just all bark but no (laughs) okay so short version of what happened I was sexually abused when I was eight years old by my older brother who was 13 and his 16 year old friend who was my father's girlfriend's son. A uh, long version. Uh, it was it was my father's summer to have the kids. So we were at his apartment in Irving for a couple months. And my father had a newer girlfriend in the picture and seemed to be perfect timing as she had a son as well, just a couple years older than my brother. So he would have someone to hang out with and bond during the time he was there and Lee, the the new girlfriend, could bond with me. Um, She was very complimentary right away from, from the start. She always said how cute I was and played with my hair and was quick to give me gifts or take me shopping for dolls as long as I was good. 
Uh, Josh and Cannon were damn near inseparable anytime they were around each other, and I caught them a few times in Josh's room checking out some old porno magazines. Um, they found in the shed and was flipping through a few times with me, he showed me a few pictures, but I didn't really understand it, so um, mostly they would play video games and just hang out. It wasn't until about halfway through the summer when uh, we were all at the apartment one day, my dad, Lee, his girlfriend, Cannon, uh, Josh, and myself, and Lee and my dad decided to go out for a bit uh, on a little date. It was still daytime, so just going out for a quick afternoon, and Josh and Cannon would babysit while they went out. Uh, I honestly thought nothing of it, and Lee had convinced my dad to go. Once they left, it was probably about five or ten minutes after, or or so after, and uh, I was sitting on the floor in the living room next to the larger sofa, coloring on the co- uh, I was coloring on the coffee table, and the TV was on playing info commercials or infomercials, uh, and so the back room had better channels. Uh, but the TV was smaller and it was in my father's room, which was in the back. And so we weren't supposed to really be back there. Uh, And so it was a a lot of infomercials that we would watch. (laughs) Um, So uh, Cannon and Josh walked into the living room from the connected kitchen and Cannon comes and sits behind me on the sofa and Josh sits farther away on the love seat in front of me. I remember seeing their faces and thinking, they looked like they were plotting something. And then Cannon leaned up to me all smiles and just said, hey Jen, why don't you have sex with us? And I'm coloring and I just, I kind of freeze. And uh, I look up at Josh and he's right in front of me in, in the love seat and, and he's fidgeting and he's not really saying much, but he's waiting for my answer. And I don't really look at Cannon, but I just say no, and and I continue coloring. And Cannon scoots in closer, and he's smirking. And he's, like, over my shoulder. And he's being real friendly, like, with his body language. Like, this is all fun and games, and uh, it's all cool. But he's got a stern tone. And he says, come on, have sex with me. And I just continue coloring, and I'm kind of just ignoring him. And I said no, and Cannon pulls away from me, and and he faces Josh, and he kind of leans back like he's getting fed up. And uh, and he says very firmly, he looks straight at Josh, and he says, if she doesn't have sex with us, I won't be your friend anymore. And Josh immediately, like, jumps on, jumps up, and he rushes to me on his knees and says, Jen, please just have sex with us, or he won't be my friend anymore. Please just do this. <laughs> uh, I start kind of coloring more aggressively, pretending I can't hear him, and... But I, I just, I see his face and I'm just, I'm just like zoning out. It seems maybe, I don't know. I, I just feel like it's almost like white noise, but again, it's like, I'm disassociating, but I'm, I'm watching it. And I just remember looking at his face and how he looked so concerned. He genuinely looked worried. Like he was scared of losing a friend. He's on his knees begging me to do this. I really didn't know what sex was. Just, you know, a few things from TV that I've heard, that I've seen, and from the magazines earlier that summer, but I didn't, but I knew I didn't want anything to do with it. Um, but there they sit, my brother on his knees, begging me for me, just waiting for an answer. And my stomach's in knots, I'm so confused, just waiting for my brother to come to my defense or say anything that makes sense. Um, wondering why he was asking this of me, even though I had said no twice already, I was wondering why it was so important to him, um, why this friendship was so important to him when I was his, I'm his sister. And it just, the room, it just, I don't know, it, it just felt like time was frozen. I had all this time to think about all this, but it seemed like the clock was ticking. It seemed so slow, but so fast at the same time. I don't know how else to explain it. I just knew, answer. And I'm just staring at him and I'm thinking, isn't this wrong? Why is he asking this of me? He's my brother. This is weird. And it just felt like I really didn't have a choice. And so I just kind of put my head down. I stopped coloring and I looked at both of them and I, well, yeah, I looked at both of them and I just kind of put my head down. And before I could even say, okay, before I could even say one word, two letters, (laughs) they had grabbed my arms 
Josh on one side and Cameron on the other and dragged me to the back room, uh, my dad's room. And um, they put me on the bed and um, Josh just hopped up on the bed and on his back, kind of scooted back and dropped his pants real quick. And I remember Cannon dropping his pants and laying down on the pallet between the bed, my dad's bed and the window, my my bed that I slept in for the summer. Um, and I just remember, I, don't, I, I was just frozen. I was just on the bed, they placed me there. I wasn't moving. I was just, I, I was a robot. I wasn't there. I was just watching it all in slow motion. And uh, I just noticed on the TV, <laughs> Xena the warrior princess was playing and it was one of my favorites <laughs> and I got really excited and I tried to just kind of focus on hearing her fight and uh, be a badass <laughs> and um, I don't know I just remember thinking like what did, I, what did I just agree to what did I just do what are we doing what is this what, what about, what's about to happen what, what's <laughs> I just didn't, I knew, I, I, I didn't understand what was about to happen and I just knew in my gut something was wrong and something was bad, something bad was really about to happen and I was just trying to figure it out, make sense of it, things have to make sense to me and um, I don't know, I just remember kind of almost feeling emotionless during the headlights but even less, I mean just, just not even scared, just frozen and like I just was watching it go down. There was no choice in the matter. There was no, and not even like, a, like there was a decision to be made. It was just watching it go down like a movie. And uh, Josh, it was like, he wasn't smirking or smiling, but he was eager. And I, I just remember looking at Cannon and Cannon said, or I, yeah, I mean, Cannon was already hard. And later this, they explained to me this is helped in the police report was um, this is what helped them decide the differences between Cannon being the main abuser and Josh being a partial victim was I had to draw um, to make sure I wasn't lying penises for the police officers and because Cannon's was erect and large and matured and Josh's was flaccid and the balls hadn't even dropped in the picture that I drew, that they realized he wasn't mature enough to make these decisions on his own, that they made him a victim as well in the case. Um, and it seemed like he got less time. I'm still trying to get all the records back to see what all went down, but it seemed as though Cameron was charged more in the case, um, and Josh was more painted as a victim as well, but he went first, so that never made sense to me. The older I got, and the more um, that things clicked, and what went down, and how, and why, and what was charged, and what wasn't, and what was never discussed. Um, so, Cannon was already hard, and he said, you have to suck his dick to get it hard, and I looked over at Josh and Josh said, yeah, come here and grab the back of my head and put my face on his penis. And I just kind of awkwardly looked back at them and Karen said, go suck it. And after I guess enough adequate time with Josh moaning and him saying, you're a natural, uh, yeah. Um, Karen said, okay, my turn. And as I'm getting over to him and he's, like telling me to come over this way. He says, you know, drop your pants or pull down your shorts. And again, it's like I'm looking over my shoulder and I know I'm like, this isn't right. I don't know what I'm doing, but this, I know this is not leading toward anything good. And I start pulling my shorts down and I get down on my knees and he pulls my head over and I put his penis in my mouth as well. And neither one of them, I mean, Luckily, I feel uh, got off. I don't know, that gives me some kind of relief, I guess. They didn't fully get their kicks, but um, uh, after, um, I don't know, however long uh, of me sucking him off, uh, we heard a noise, luckily. <laughs> Perfect timing, I guess. Uh, and so I kind of freaked out and stood up and 
ran to the bathroom, got tripped over my shorts. The bathroom had two doors to it, one to the bedroom, one to the hallway of the apartment. And uh, the boys kind of straightened up and came out of the room and you can kind of hear muffled talk of like, that's not acceptable. Why are we all in the back room? And then kind of talking about, oh, well, TV's better. And, um, and they're just kind of like, well, don't you know, do that again. And I, um, when I think it's been, I don't know, I just, I, I'm, I'm in the bathroom and I'm thinking, I'm waiting for it to be clear, it's safe, it's time for me to come out. And I'm, I'm looking in the mirror and I'm looking down at myself and I'm like, I'm free. And, uh, and, I, and I, I was just relieved. And it was just like, oh, that could have been so bad. And then I felt disgusting <laughs> because I was like, that could have been so bad, but I don't know how or why or what, what was about to happen. Was that sex? Was that... I just felt, what did I just do? Why did I just allow that? What just happened? What what did I just do? And I, I just felt disgusted. And, and, and why did my brother just allow this to happen? I don't know, it just, I was so disgusted and just, I, I just, I, I grabbed my pants and I pulled them up and I just kind of straightened myself up and stopped crying. And I thought I was clear and I came out of the hallway and Cannon was right there just waiting and it was like a monster in the shadows came right behind me grabbed up my arm and he said and he whispered like in this stern tone to me if you tell anybody this happened i will kill you and your mother so i didn't say a damn one i spent the rest of the summer just as fine nothing else happened i didn't say a word josh ended up snitching on himself because he was so nervous that i had told <laughs> I thought I was it's my mom. <laughs> that was the one thing I was unsure. I was like, do I do this podcast or do I not? You know, I don't want this story getting out before I can tell my children. But by the time they're old enough to Google or anything, I will have had to have had this conversation with them in a way that will help them learn to not be fucking assholes in life, especially my son, but my daughter too just as a human being and being a good person. I mean, just treating others and you don't know what other people are going through. And hopefully when I get to that conversation, you know, it won't be a oh, poor mom conversation, but a we can do it anyway conversation. Look what she's done. Look how far we've come. I don't, that's the only thing that was really hard because I don't want to hide this from them, but I don't want the... Oh, Poor mom. I don't want a poor mom reaction. I this did not break me. I I I, I rose above it. I it, you know I think it has has caused me many struggles in my life, and it and it's not over. But I'm working through them. But I have to take everything as a lesson, and I'm learning very hard lessons, and <laughs> how not to be very angry all the time. But I'm getting there. And I've learned that you cannot hide from this. <laughs> you cannot run from it. You cannot bury it. You cannot drown it out with drugs or alcohol. You can't drown it out with sex. You can't run away from it. You you have to hit, face it head on, and or it's just gonna you're gonna spin out of control. And like layers, you will shed. And it, I mean, slowly but surely, you will get lighter. I feel lighter the farther I go in this journey, but there are things that still weigh me down that I'm working on. It's just, it's a process. They split, obviously, after this went down. Uh, quickly after, yeah. <laughs> My dad has played pretty oblivious in this whole situation, not you know, honestly, my dad is estranged from me. We are reconnecting now and trying to piece something together. Um, but his memory isn't the best, honestly. And I think he chooses not to remember a lot. And so when I did have questions and this podcast did come up, um, he couldn't even remember her last name or give me any information uh, on her or really have any desire to talk about it other than you know, us and our relationship moving forward. My mom at first reacted, it seemed very immediate and attentive, but it was more like pointing blame and jumping on, making sure that it wasn't Josh that was to blame. She constantly tried to blame my dad. And when, when we came home from the summer, 
my brother and I's rooms are adjacent from each other. We share a bathroom and I never wanted to be in my room because I felt like he was always going to somehow come in there. And he was always so close to me. He wouldn't let me be around my mom alone. He was just always right there just so I would keep my mouth shut. I wasn't saying a word because of what Cannon had already threatened me with. But Josh, I don't think, was even aware of that. He was just so nervous that I was going to say a word that he was just always there. So at night, I would try and sneak away to my mom's room. And once he found out that I was doing that, he would sneak into her room too. Well, one night I got away with it and he woke up the next morning and in a pure like he was ghost white and sweat and panic and ran into the bedroom and like burst into the room and my mom just looked up at him and was like what is going on and he was just like I just want to be near sister I just want to be near sister I just want to be I'm just worried about her I'm just want to be near her and she just immediately separated us and he threw up in the bathroom and just was in a pure panic and she sat him down and she talked to him. I don't know what he said. I think he just said something went down in the summer because he didn't say he, it was him. And when my mom finally asked me, she was more leaning, like, was it your dad? Was It was your dad, wasn't it? And trying to point towards him more than hear what I had to say about it. I was so, I was in shock. Like I'd never even considered my dad. And she was just like, it was Curtis, right? It was your father. And I was like, no, absolutely not. It was Josh and Cannon. And she was just like, oh my God. She freaked out immediately. And was like, it was the boys. And it was like, I swear, it was just on fast forward. And her and my stepdad closed up in their room and just talked and tried to figure it out and then took us to the police station. And then it just seemed like it was on fast forward again to where I was talking to multiple police officers and telling my story, but not telling all the way up to the story and then being cut off constantly. It was like, they were all, what led up to this? What led up to this? It was the dad's fault. It was the mom's fault. It was the older boy's fault. It was all to like seem to get blame off of Josh. That was, it seemed like the only angle. No one was worried about what happened to me um, until after I was done with my report. And they even brought in this, they used to bring in a pencil and a spiral because we want to make sure that she's not just making this story up. She needs to draw a penis. They didn't want to hear my story. They just wanted me to draw a penis so I knew what I was talking about and what I really did. They didn't ask me what happened. I just said they did stuff to me. And they didn't do a rape, t- t- rape kit yet. They were just making sure that the story all was out before they went and moved any further. And, and, they, and I just remember them cutting me off constantly before I would actually say what happened. And they said, before we go any farther, she needs to draw a penis to co- corroborate her story or to make sure that she's not just ma- fabricating all this up. And that's what threw me off. I was just like, Again, I felt emotionless because I was like, why, what do I even know about this stuff? Why would I make, why would I make this up? Who makes this up? What, who does this? Who does this happen to? What, this isn't normal. So why would I say it? And I just remember being completely just out of it. Just like, well, just, this is um, not happening to me. I'm not a kid anymore. It just, I felt completely stripped of my innocence after that moment. After, it was like the moment that Cannon asked me to have sex with him, I was like a robot for a whole hot minute. I I just, nothing, I had to prove these things happened to me. I didn't even get to tell them what happened to me. I had to draw two different dicks on paper and because I drew one that was big and and erect and mature and one that was flaccid, they that is one of the main things that made sure that Cannon was charged more and that Josh was painted as a victim. He wasn't even hard. He didn't want his sister's mouth on his dick. He was forced to do this. He went first. What do you mean? (laughs) He was forced to do this. He didn't grab his own head and suck his own dick. (laughs) I just, 
it didn't make any sense to me. So it just seemed not real. And they said I was emotionless, so it seemed to not affect me. So therapy wasn't much. And they didn't ask me questions because they didn't want to trigger it and make it all come back. So hopefully I would just forget it. So because I didn't talk about it, because I didn't want to, uh, and because I didn't talk about it, they said I was cured. And so I was in therapy really quickly. And then they, I mean, and I did fast forward, sorry. After the police report, I went to the doctor. My mom took me there. I had to get a rape test done and my cherry was intact. So I wasn't touched. I was fine. They weren't worried about it at all. Oh, she wasn't, she wasn't abused. So I just saw the dicks. I probably nothing even happened. Uh, I didn't even, they didn't even know that I had to give them blowjobs because they didn't need to know. My hymen was intact. I was not abused. So they didn't even go, they didn't even go to Judy for uh, like a year. And I asked my mom, she couldn't even remember. Oh, I don't even think it was a year. And my mom's been covering it up since it happened. She's been trying to blame my dad this whole time. When the judge, uh, decided, you know, Josh to get however long he got in Juvie, not even a year, uh, to Canton and to get whatever he got, Juvie. They got out at the same time, so they, they did Juvie at the same time, and then Cannon went to, like, the Texas Commission's something for youth uh, for a while, and then when he turned 18, he went to jail for a little bit, so I don't know how that worked out. And then I would get checks from him. But from that moment on, the judge said that he was not to be around me, not to be a certain fear around me. He could live under the same roof, so he had to go live with his father. And my mom begged the judge for uh, me to go live with my father and for her to go, for her to take care of my brother because this didn't happen under her roof and he needs more care, obviously, because more was done to him um, and he needs more focus. And she, I mean, yeah. The more, the older I got, the more that hurt. <laughs> but luckily, the judge said hell no. <laughs> I guess luckily, um, and ever since then, she's been begging me and introducing him into my life constantly, whether he was loud or not, because he's my brother and I should forgive him. And I just remember immediately after all of this went down, and the judge and had decided and made his decision and, and my mother was horrified and I remember being outside and it was dusk and the, the, sun, the sun's going down and it's I'm sitting on the trampoline and I remember seeing the light of the kitchen shining out and they're just stressed and talking the adults are talking inside they're all trying to figure out what they're about to do and I remember seeing Josh come out the back door and I remember freezing and I'm like looking at the window thinking someone's gonna come out here because I, he's not supposed to be around me. Where is everyone? Where is everyone? Where is everyone? He's not supposed to be around me. And he comes out and he crawls up on the trampoline and I'm just staring at the window waiting for someone to come out. And he grabs me and he puts me in his lap and he just pulls me in tight and he just holds me and he says, you know, I love you, right? You know, I'm your brother and I would never do anything to hurt you, right? You know that, right? And he's squeezing tighter and tighter and won't let me go. And I'm realizing he's not going to let me go until I agree. And so I say, I know. And he lets go. And I just realized kind of at that point, no one's coming to save me. I got to do it on my own. And I just kind of feel like I've I've done that my whole life. Like I just, I, I, I knew I was doing it on my own. I know growing up I was a bit of a brat and, and a selfish person. And I remember growing up, my brother feeling on the outskirts because he was there and I was here with his mom and I was definitely a daddy's girl and my mom was definitely and my brother was definitely a mama's boy and she was always on his defense and I just remember him always his nickname for me was rat or brat and I ruined his life he gave everything he could to ROTC when he moved up here to Dallas to live with my dad and let his grades go to shit or barely passing so that he could go to ROTC and he was going to join the Marines and better his life and be better. And the brat, rat, spoiled little daughter that got everything she ever wanted wouldn't outshine him. And he got all the way up there. It was never about me. No one ever knew what happened. No one ever wanted to know. Well, you weren't raped. That was always the thing. That was always the thing. I always felt like a fraud because in the end, when my mom would always say that to be all growing up, well, you weren't raped. Well, you weren't raped. Uh, all, all growing up, you weren't raped. 
When I finally broke down and went off on my mom and said I was raped, I felt like such a fraud because I did tell her I was raped. And I felt like such a fraud because even then I still wasn't able to tell what happened to, to me. Oh my God, I had no idea. Jen, the doctor said that your hymen was still intact. There was no way that you were raped. I, I, I had no idea you were actually raped. I didn't know. You didn't ask. You didn't ask if I was raped. I, I was raped, mom. And still to this day, I, I feel like a fraud because she still doesn't know what happened. And I technically, in my mind, know that I could it could have been a lot worse and I was not raped. I mean, my mouth was... <laughs> It's been a hard, rough battle of trying to get to over these things. And if I should introduce them to my children and she's introduced my brother many times to my children with photos and names and stories. I even caught her when I, she was watching my child. I went to my friend's birthday party. I call her and I ask her where she's going. She said, out of town. I said, where? She was meeting up. My daughter was three months old. No, I'm sorry, six months old at the time. She was going to meet up with my brother for his birthday. Took my daughter out of county lines to meet my abuser for his birthday and not tell me about it because she knew I'd say no. And I was out of town. So there's nothing I could do about it. My children know he exists because of her showing photos and telling stories and them saying, who's Josh? Because I don't talk about a brother. And she told them it was my brother, it was her son. We only know he exists because of her. And even if it had, honestly, weirdly enough, no one would know because no one wanted to hear about it. <laughs> like, it's been the same story, but who would know? <laughs> I mean, through the random years of me trying to randomly shout things out to them, yeah, they kind of have a gist. But it's been the same thing in my head. <laughs> so... I don't want to, um, out of respect, I don't want to mention too much of relation, but I know a family member of his, he had already abused. Um, and then I don't know how many others, but I know that he had an issue with pulling girls into the bathroom in high school. That's the reason he was taken away from his father, other than finding sex toys and things of his dad's and, and uh, messing with those is the reason his dad lost custody um, and, his, and was in his mom's care to begin with. So for his mom to be covering his tracks already, she was already aware of the issues. He had already yeah, abused one person, if not many others, by pulling them into the bathroom. I feel like law enforcement could have gone more intensely. I feel like, yes, it was a delicate topic, and I don't think a lot of people wanted to touch on it or hear it. Um, but I think that they should have dove a little deeper to understand more than just hear the concerns of obviously a worried mom of two kids. They went off of more of what she was saying more than what really happened. Uh, once they heard that Cannon had threatened me and threatened life of two people, that's the only reason he got charged more. And the fact that he was older, so they were saying that he was preying on both of us. That was one thing I was, it was really hard to get over is trying to not be so angry and trying to understand and allowing myself to understand. I was like, I didn't want to understand and make sense of it. Even though in my mind, that's how it works. I have to make sense, things have to make sense to me. And so, I didn't want to accept him, my brother being a victim as well. He was my brother. He was my older brother. He was supposed to protect me, not do this to me. And the fact that he went first was always what stuck with me. And the fact that he had then afterwards continued to press the matter and, and point fingers and call me a rat and blame me for ruining his life. And he ended up not being able to join the Marines because they saw his record and they don't let child pedophiles into the military. So then I again took something away from him and ruined his future and was a rat. You know, all signs to me seemed to point to that, but it seemed like I was the only one. The more my family found out about it, the more family members found out about it, everybody was like, he's your brother. It happens, get over it. It was such a lack of shock to everyone that found out about it that I just kind of stopped talking about it. I just kind of want everyone to know out there that feels this way or feels alone that this is only happening to them or that 
they they deserved it or if they feel guilty I, I battle this was the biggest struggle for me is not feeling guilty somehow I feel like everything is my fault I instantly someone walk in, walks into a room and they're asking questions I'm like oh no I'm in trouble and I have absolutely nothing to do with me I'm to blame instantly in everything I'm sorry all the time and I just, I'm sick of it. And it, makes, and it makes me even more mad. It's just, it's, I'm apolog- apologetic or anger and then just sadness and then more anger because I'm sad. And I don't want to be sad. And it's just, it's vicious. It's a vicious cycle. But I just, anyone that feels this way, that they're not alone. And it took me so long to understand that I'm not alone and that I, and that I have people out there on my side and that this happens way more than it should. And the more I talked to people, the more I understood that this happens so often, it's sickening. I am a fourth, I am a third generation sexual abuse of family, and I am making damn sure that neither one of my children are the fourth. If with anything in my power, it's not going to happen. I just want them to know that we can do this, <laughs> that, that we need to talk. We need to be vocal. You have to talk about these things. You have to spread awareness about these things. I thought I was the only one. My best friend in the whole wide world that I've known for the longest time since sixth grade thought she was the only one. We thought we were the only ones in silence together. Didn't tell each other. And then finally I told her. And way years later down the road did she tell me. Me, who would understand? We have got to stop hiding. We've got to start talking to each other and and showing each other that unfortunately, as shitty as it is, it happens a lot and you're not alone. And it's not, and it's weird. Yes, it's weird, but it's not just weird for you. It's so, it, it, it happened to me and I still can't, I still mind boggled by it. It, it does not make sense. I go round and round. I, I just hit walls every time because I'm, I'm someone you're supposed to protect. In every movie you think about, in every book you read, I swear, you have that big brother role. That's what everyone sees. Yet, that's not what I have. That's not what a lot of people have. Creepy old men are my specialty. I used to be a bartender and a server. And I mean, that was my go-to for easy money. And one of my best friends, I grew up in a retirement home. My mom used to be the senior citizen center director. I love old people, but my twisted innocence, I don't know. It was just easy money and a sick game. I mean, it's just, it's just sad, but it happens way more than it should. And, it, and, and, and everyone thinks that they're the only ones. I've heard too many stories that I'm like, what? You too? That it, it's just like, fuck, I don't want to be a part of this game anymore. I don't want to be a part of this gang anymore. But we have to, and we've got to stop being so ashamed of it because they're winning. I hope to gain just more awareness, of course, more vocalization, more talking about it, but just a release. It's just some more weight, just some, just a release of weight of blame, of judgment of myself, of guilt I've put on my shoulders for things I can't control, just things I've allowed for too long that's acceptable. I just hope to regain a voice somehow in this and just get my story out there for once in my life and just on my own terms that I just, this is what happened. This is, I just want to, just releasing some weight. (laughs) I've known Jennifer for a good minute. Upon first meeting her, and you'd have to know me to understand this as I'm way more introverted and quiet than I might appear online. I was put off by her intense positivity. It was a case of, fuck, it's too early for this shit. I still need my coffee. But my gut was telling me to pay attention. Something was off. As I got to know her, I realized what my gut was saying was she's been through something horrible. And as we talked a bit more, I not only found myself to be so heartbroken by her story, but I instinctually said to her, hey, I have a platform for you if you need it. And she so graciously accepted. Not only this though, but I'm proud as hell to call her my friend, and I'm looking forward to that supervised play date with our kiddos. Jennifer, thank you so much for walking into my life. I am incredibly proud of you, as well as your strength and your perseverance, and I find it highly admirable that you will laugh in the face of adversity 
despite what others try to do. I mean, look at me. I can't even laugh in the face of adversity. I, I just get mad and bitch about it all the time. But I've seen you grow into something so fierce, something so amazing, and I just can't begin to express how strong you are. You are the kind of person where if you were told to shovel shit for a living, you'd hate it, but you'd still do it with a smile. Your ethic, your generosity, gregarious vibe, survivor spirit, and steadfastness are something we all can truly learn from. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for not only trusting us to help you tell your story, but for being my friend. With everything Courtney just said, and with Jennifer's story, it comes as no shock that she is absolutely a bee. Jennifer is beautiful, strong, resilient, and once vulnerable. She, however, did not sting. She instead methodically pushed through and demanded her power back, saving her sting until it became necessary. And with that, we will protect her and all the bees at all costs. For without bees, we as a human race cannot survive and thrive. So be vigilant for when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. Thank you for listening to A Nefarious Nightmare. Music used in the theme was originally by Ghost Stories Incorporated. Remixed by Ryan RCX Murphy. Additional background music is provided by Epidemic Sound. A Nefarious Nightmare is scripted, researched, and produced by Courtney Fenner and Amanda Cronin. I'm Lainey Hobbs. And as always, be vigilant. For when you mess with the bees, you get the hive. The hive.